Hey there, sinners. It's Adam Knox, and welcome to another episode of The Cult of You and another segment of The Interview of the Devil. In this week's segment, I get to speak to Phil Farber, the author of High Magic. High being the operative keyword. Now, Phil is not just some person that really enjoys a good joint and figured how to write a book of magic about it. He does have quite an established background as a professional practitioner of neurolinguistic programming and hypnosis. In fact, being one of the earlier adopters inside of this practice and having Richard Bandler himself write the foreword and excerpts on many of his books. Phil's earlier work, specifically Brain Magic and the Book of Athem, or Meta Magic, really dives deeply inside of the subject of NLP and its utilization and its role in magic and how this expressed. This is one of my reasons that I wanted to have the conversation with Phil because of how good those books are in bringing about those subjects. Now our subject today also explores high magic, his latest work, and as such the exploration of the use of cannabis inside of magic or magic inside of cannabis, however you want to look at it. I want to just preface this with a couple of things. Firstly, I'm not saying, and neither is Phil saying, that you need to use drugs or you need to use cannabis or that any of that is a requirement for magic or, you know, a, a, a necessity. He's simply offering for those that have an interest in these to actually explore them in a way that's relatively healthy. I recommend that instead of just jumping at it, that you get a copy of the book High Magic and you really learn about these ideas. In fact, I would even recommend that you start at the beginning get his earlier books and that's one of my recommendations for all authors really instead of just getting where they are now especially if you're new to it start where they started work through that journey because as their own psychology progressed you see that in their work and as such you will find a healthier approach to it now i have myself experimented with the use of cannabis inside of ritual and when i was a younger just for the fun and recreation of it some it works for, some it doesn't. I found that in the later stages of my work, it doesn't. I found that I had intense experiences from just a very small hit, as we can say. And the truth of the matter is it is not something that I utilize inside of my ritual. But I do also see the value of the plant medicines, and there's just not the plant spirit that I personally choose to work with. That doesn't mean it's wrong for you. Maybe it is right for you. But if you have a personality that suffers from any type of addiction, I recommend that you do not begin this type of work until it's something that you've dealt with. In fact, if you are aware of my work, if you watched any of my other videos, you will realize that responsible occultism is the priority of my focus. This is why my own course on the cult of Zede is modular, and I do not release content that an individual is not ready for until they've progressed to those stages. And it's because of that that subjects like sex magic only comes in about six months into the process. Subjects like uh, dark magic and the, the draconian work actually only comes in, in over a year and a half inside of my course and only at the entire end of my two-year system do I release my work my ideas on the work of plant medicines now I'm not saying that everyone follows that suit you may have a completely different background in shamanism or in other practices and it may just not have that same effect with you but to simply take the advice of somebody on the internet is not a good idea it is irresponsible and the first law of being a magi is recognizing that we are all gods which means we are all completely responsible for our own actions. I will say then, if you're not doing it for those reasons, if you're not doing it because you have an addictive personality or because you're trying to escape your reality, but because you're simply looking for another edge, another dimension, perhaps this is what you look for. But maybe you find where the beauty in his interesting ideas and very well put together research on the subject of cannabis and the cannabinoids inside of our brain, how this goes about affecting reality, the interesting history and the use of it in yoga and many other practices which we cover in today's discussion we also explore subjects like goisha we explore the multiple personality situation inside of the brain the view on nlp on that what these discoveries are showing and we discuss a lot of the nlp kind of concepts and premises so whether you are pro or con cannabis i am confident in today's discussion you will find something of value and interest so sit back relax and remember to live deliciously
Phil, it's an absolute honor to have you on the cult of you. I have been, I've been a fan of some of the revolutionary ideas you've had in your in your books. And I just want to say it's a gift and a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for taking the time to be with me today. Sure. Thanks for having me on. I kind of want to get into some some juicy bits of conversation, and especially for a lot of uh, listeners, some of the ones that I, I'm, I'm confident there's a lot that are very deeply familiar with your work, um, but especially for those that aren't very, uh, that are maybe new to some of your ideas. You've had a very beautiful grounding in terms of your psychology, where a lot of other occultists and practitioners that are out there uh, really have an extremely, I would sometimes say, ex extreme spiritual state. They're not very well grounded in practical magic, so to speak, in the practical application of these ideas in the day to day life from influencing ourselves to influencing our world. Um, you've had that from the ground up. I remember some of the earlier kind of works from the Book of Athen to uh, Brain Magic. Brain Magic was just one of those nuggets. It was a conversational relationship between some of the classic principles of NLP applied to practical magic and making sense of a lot of very esoteric ideas and very things. You you were trained with Richard Bandler, you kind of had a, a basis on it. Can you, you know, talk a little bit about that journey? Where was the first kind of connections for you? Did it come from NLP into magic or were you with magic and then the NLP just helped take it to a next level? How did that marriage occur? Well, I, I was involved in uh, practicing hypnosis from a very early age. Um, the, uh, let's see, um, it goes way back. Uh, my my father had a collection of books on uh, hypnosis that were on the shelves when I was a kid, and I was uh, told, "Don't read those; that's for adults only." So, of course, I had to read them all. And uh, <laughs> at the age of like I don't know, eleven, twelve, I guess, maybe even a little younger, I was uh, practicing hypnosis with my friends and stuff. This was all really old school kind of stuff. Um, oh yeah, uh, sort of that authoritarian. Uh, long scripts yeah right right yeah. exactly and uh Countdown. yeah so uh i it sort of opened me up that and some uh, uh, unusual experiences i had at an early age sort of opened me up to the idea of altered states and that maybe there's a little bit more to reality than we normally perceive like you know on the surface level here and mm. uh i got into magic and nlp probably around the same at around the same time, um, the I was getting involved in uh, reading books by Crowley and maybe starting to practice that. And uh, I had been meditating also from an early age, along with those uh, uh, the hypnosis stuff. Uh, I, I was doing a little bit of yoga meditation and stuff like that. Um, and um, so I guess this was when I was in college. I must have been in you know nineteen twenty, I guess, and. Uh, I was really, uh, my emphasis has always been on, uh, towards being a writer and, and writing well. And in college, I took a lot of classes on psychology of language and things like that, sort of looking for that secret key, right? What is it that makes mm -hmm. language compelling and wonderful and draws people in and, and engages them uh, and changes their minds and their states and so on? Uh, and... The psychology of language courses, eh, not so much. It was a lot of theory about grammar and uh, things like that. There was there were some nice bits in there, Noam Chomsky's transformational grammar and things like that, but nothing really practical. And mm. uh, so around that time, I found in the school library, uh, I don't know how it got there. Somebody must have requested it, but there was uh, NLP Volume 1, Robert Dilt's et al. book. And uh, oh, nice. uh, I started looking at that and I was like, wow, this is what I'm looking for. This this actually has some pragmatic things, stuff you can do <laughs> to make your language more mm -hmm. compelling, to uh, to connect with people, to get different kinds of results and so on. And uh, you know, NLP always has had that bias that it's sort of aimed towards therapists, right? towards, uh, you know, healing problems and things like that. Um, and that that's an interest of mine, of course. But. The, uh, the, the thing that first struck me was like how applicable it was to so many areas of life, right? And mm -hmm. to my writing, certainly, and, uh, but also personal relationships and meeting new people and making new friends and 
and and then also as I started getting into magic, uh, around that same time, I, uh, a friend of mine accidentally left a copy of uh, uh, a couple, actually a couple copies of uh, Crowley, uh, Alistair Crowley's books, uh, in my apartment, and so I started reading those and. First of all, noticing a few little areas where Crowley actually had some maybe intuitive sense or natural sense of uh, kind of NLP-like things that he was doing mm-hmm. and how some of the uh, the aspects of magic could be more readily understood with NLP concepts. I mean, for instance, the symbols and the, the way you vibrate words and the gestures and things like that were all what we call an NLP anchors, right? So I started thinking about how how do you work that from an NLP point of view? How do you make an anchor more intense and things like that? And that started coming together. And uh, uh, however, at the time, NLP was not really well known. This is like uh, early 1980s, I guess. And uh, it's it sort of, it still kind of has a weird reputation, particularly in America here, uh, that it's it's mind control and whatever. But uh, the uh, uh, so when I was getting involved, I was meeting people from, magical orders and things at that point. And I would say, you know, hey, I'm reading about this NLP stuff and you know, I think, you, you know, uh, <laughs> use some of that to uh, get involved in that. And they were all like, no, no, you can't do that. You must do it the way Crowley, Regardi, et cetera. You know? <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> You're breaking with tradition now. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And even though those guys were the tradition breakers, right? I mean, Crowley in particular, <laughs> Exactly. You know, and, and Crowley at various points in his writing really emphasizes the fact that your own rituals are always going to be better than than the ones that you get out of the book. And uh, you can learn a lot from the, from the ones in the book. And there's a lot of good principles and, and mm-hmm. ways to do things, of course. But when you start putting your own personal content in there and NLP and Ericksonian hypnosis, that's kind of what it's all about. Uh, mm. uh, then you get more intense and different kinds of results. It's it's so key. I found that it was when I took the NLP model and I re-looked at magic and I was stopped. I stopped looking at the verbatim repeating of things and I was looking to model it. What was the pattern behind the ritual? You know, what was happening in the brain? What was the meaning that was being set up in these things? How was I installing these anchors through those letters and those words? And then getting those results, seeing those actual shifts versus just trying to verbatim read something in an old grimmer that just didn't make sense. Opened up so many doors for me. What was, what was a couple of like aha realizations or techniques that you just kind of shifted that really opened up the mind of possibilities for yourself? Oh, geez. There's been so many that (laughs) it's hard to pick one or two. Um, I think very early on that the idea of, using the NLP techniques uh, to anchor that you could, um, for instance, when you, when you would learn a ritual, like say the, the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. And you have words and you vibrate them and you make pentagrams and things like that. The thing is, is that the way that the rituals are taught and described, typically it's only described in like one sense or two senses or something like you see the, the, the pentagram, you uh, you hear the word, whatever, right? And I found yeah. the NLP idea of using all of your senses in to create anchors in, in each one of these experiences just totally intensified it right away, right? When I would create an anchor, uh, again, the Lester Bouncing Ritual of Pentagram, you have, um, let's say, the, the archangels who represent these elemental powers, Right. And then at one point you have the, the elemental qualities rush through the circle and, and so on. Now, mm. what I did was I actually went out and created experiences, right? For water, I went to a lake and I fell in backwards as I anchored and said the word and stuff like that. So when I, uh, or uh, for, <laughs> for air, I stood on top of a mountain nearby here in, in the wind and felt the wind and remembered it all and created anchors that way as I said the words. And That's brilliant. so eventually when I went back into my, my ritual room in my circle and performed the ritual, 
I was suddenly connecting to these experiences very, very powerfully. And water was water and air was air and fire was fire and earth was earth. And in, in ways that was just so much more powerful. And, uh, and that has stayed, I mean, I did that like, you know, one time set these anchors. This has got to be almost 40 years ago now. And, uh, uh, and it's still with me. I, I can still still do those rituals, and suddenly those experiences come up like very, very powerfully. The tools are so, so incredibly useful, and I mean, I loved like the amount of techniques. The 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 grim the the brain magic book to me was like the grimoire of, of NLP in terms of magic because of like the quick practicality. Because I, you know, just talking about the LBRP myself, it was the NLP techniques that helped me break through it because. I realized growing up in an extremely religious environment that even though consciously I thought pentagram good, unconsciously my body was still anchored to pentagram bad. So no matter how many times I did the ritual, I still had negative results because I was technically firing off the wrong anchor. Yes. And only when I was able to collapse the anchor, suddenly did the technique work for me and kind of open up. So this... I think for a lot of us kind of opens up that, especially when you, you anchor in some of those letters in those God names and you fire off very different states of consciousness together and it opens up the realm of consciousness to different states. Was this an entry point for you to start really exploring altered states of consciousness? How did that evolve? What was the, what was the progression from there for yourself? Well, I think the altered state stuff was sort of a parallel thing to the magic. Um, I, I was already very interested in that at the time, and um, that really started, uh, like I said, I was practicing hypnosis and, and meditating at a very early age, and uh, mm. so that, that sparked that interest, and I, I already had the sense that, that you could go in and out of different altered states at will and, and things like that. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I was in a bicycle accident and uh, landed on my head, <laughs> uh, had a, wow. uh, a severe head trauma, and uh, actually had a near-death experience. And sure. uh, a very intense thing where I was out of my body, and there were entities, and uh, uh, I don't want to get into the whole thing, but uh, mm. it, what it did at that age as a teenager was just open my, my mind to the fact that there's just something way beyond ordinary reality that we can all experience. And mm. uh, so that actually, uh, I wanted to understand that more. And uh, so I, I started looking into other kinds of altered states, including more intense meditation uh, and to the point where I was uh, meditating for multiple hours every day uh, for some years. Uh, and this is, this is a little, this is a few years later after I got out of high school and so on. But at, at that age, I was very interested in, uh, the altered states that were available to me back then, and this was in the late 1970s uh, in America. And if you know anything about high school uh, in uh, uh, North America in the 1970s, it was all about yes. cannabis and, and acid, basically. And, uh, so that's really what was what was available. And so I, I got into that right away. And I, you know, as a teenager, I smoked a lot of weed. Uh, and had some very interesting experiences and started to combine it even at that age with the meditation and so on. Uh, and actually, I had a very, uh, one of my most powerful experiences um, around that age, 16, 17, uh, I was camping with a friend of mine and we brought a little bag of weed with us and um, in the tent at night and uh, smoked a joint and got, got pretty high and uh, I started, it was just, it was night, it was dark, there were stars up above, uh, and I started meditating a little bit, and started relaxing muscles, and meditating. And suddenly I popped into this space where, uh, I, I, where I had never been with cannabis before, where I was just very, very high, and felt connected to everything, and uh, was uh, seeing like beautiful geometric visuals, and things like that, and, uh, and that stuck with me uh, for a very long time that you could do that with cannabis, right? It's, because most of my friends were smoke some pot, drink some beer, uh, <laughs> go hang out, watch TV yeah. or go to a movie, whatever, you know, it was fun. Right. But, uh, mm. but suddenly I had this experience where suddenly this sense of 
connection with the stars and the, the trees and everything. And it, it was it was wonderful. And uh, uh, that really stayed with me to the point where I always knew that there was that possibility with cannabis. So um, that went on. And of course, I think- uh, and when I was in college, uh, again, this is America in the late 70s and uh, <laughs> early 80s. And uh, the college I went to was actually famous for its its quality LSD. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, so I, I sampled nice. some of that and mushrooms and things like that's, that. That's what you call higher education. Yes, yes, a much higher education. And uh, <laughs> the, the school I went to was that was famous for in the 1960s being the source that the the U.S. government, the CIA, and so on, used to make their LSD in the laboratory. And, uh, oh, brilliant! And, and, and apparently, some of the chemists who had been involved in that began to freelance. Let's say, uh, again, uh, as I was beginning to learn about meditation and magic and so on, I would have insights during these trips and so on. It was uh, that made it a little bit more uh, conducive and so on. Uh, I think one of the things that's kind of useful here in terms of the frame, just something that you're bringing up, your 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 book. High man, your book on high magic and cannabis is just an absolute like wonderful piece. But we're going to talk about we're going to go into that a little bit more. I just want to say I just want to ask one of the biggest frames we moved from that shift in the mindset is that there was that difference in terms of set and setting, and you illustrated it quite nicely by kind of making that shift out of the almost just the social recreational use of cannabis and even the same with, with, with LSD and others to almost that ritualistic shamanic kind of a thing. Now you mentioned that you had the experience where you were seeing the geometrical colors and that was something you just kind of spontaneously kind of led into. Was it, was there ever an initial intention to use the, um, the, the cannabinoids in conjunction with spiritual development or this, did this naturally happen as a progression of just, you know, getting high? Well, I, I think in the back of my mind, there was always that idea that uh, getting high would be a little bit like meditation or hypnosis and, and that there would be something beneficial and expanding uh, from it and maybe even enhancing, right? Um, uh, in terms of like creativity and consciousness and, and uh, intelligence and so on. Uh, so that was always sort of in the back of my mind. I mean, I, I grew up, uh, you know, figure the back when I was growing up, it was sort of, we were sort of coming out of the, the sixties, right? I, I, I lived through that as a child and witnessed all of the, the crazy stuff that was going on in America during the great 60s. time. And some of these, I mean, you know, I, I was, I loved the Beatles and the Stones and, you know, things like that, that kids loved at that, uh, at that time. And they were always, you know, there was some aspect of, uh, you know, LSD that was always, and psychedelia that ran through a lot of that, particularly the Beatles. Uh, you know, mm. they, they sort of took a lot of us with them on their trip. <laughs> and uh, yes. Yes. Um, so it was sort of part of the background. I mean, the, definitely part of the set and setting of the time and place where I grew up. Uh, that there was something expanding about it and that it was peace and love and Tim Leary was in the news all the time and so on. So that there was some kind of, you know, there were certain presuppositions and and uh, uh, background aspects of the set and setting that were there all along. And, okay. and okay. I always had that sense that that's kind of where I wanted to explore uh, was mm. the... I was always, even as a little kid, I I read a lot of science fiction and fantasy and I was very interested in like ESP and paranormal and things like that. Uh, The amazing Kreskin was my hero, even though he was a, I thought. I think that's also quite quite an awakening for a lot of people because uh, there's, there's the experience or the perception that getting high is just getting high. Um, But the truth is for a lot of people that have kind of explored, we're now in that revolution. I mean, we've been in that revolution progressively getting more and we're at a period in life where more research is being funded to the effects of altered states of consciousness and what's kind of possible inside of that. And a lot of spiritual individuals I've, I found and utilizations I found in my own experience um, opens up to almost a, a psychic dimension or what appears to be a psychic dimension. I refer to it as almost like a non-local communication. The brain 
calculate so much information that's usually consciously being locked out because of our normal rational survival critical factor does the you have you find that the use of certain cannab of cannabis and maybe even lsd kind of opened that up and then how much of that is steerable by the practitioner and how much is completely out of your control okay um it, it comes down to of course as tim leary said set setting and dosage right and the um how much control you have it is often a matter of your your intent and where you go into it with right also the dosage right i mean if uh, for instance, particularly with the with the classical psychedelics like LSD, if your dosage is very high, that's just going to overwhelm anything else. I mean, you're, there, there's yeah. not much else you could do but just kind of sit back and enjoy it, right? Um, Submit. The, uh, on the other hand, cannabis is much more controllable in, in its normal range of doses and so on. Um, you know, mm. you, you smoke a joint or have a few bong hits or something like that, right? It's You, you can make the choice of what you're going to do. And for the most part, most of us, at least in the culture that I inhabit here, um, there's always some intent, right? It's not just about get, getting high, although there's certain people who it's always, it's just about the getting high, um, but it's about getting high and doing something, right? So let's get high and go for a walk, right? Let's get high and meditate. Let's get high and look at some art, right? Um, and uh, I think a lot of people have that sense that it's not just you know all about the the end of getting high right uh, um like it like in a so Cheech and Chong movie everything they do is <laughs> is aimed at getting high rather than what they're going to do when they're high uh so so, so then if the, if the setting setting is is such a big thing not just the external setting setting if the person doing this if they maybe have a lot of fear about this a lot of misconceptions is that part of what's going to create their negative experience if they have a bad experience or is that besides dose obviously having a large dose that they're maybe not ready for and then not dealing with that for somebody that's maybe had bad experiences and they're looking to kind of explore this again because they feel a calling to it but maybe they're afraid of having a bad experience what are maybe some tools or some ideas or thoughts to to for somebody like that well the 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 first thing I, I always recommend, and I repeat this ad nauseum in High Magic, is uh, learn your ritual first, separately. Learn your mm -hmm. substances first, separately, right? Before you right. combine them, right? So so you have some sense of comfort with both the ritual aspects and and the actual altered state itself before you start combining them and doing even more intense things. Um, the, uh, that's, that's, that goes a long way. Right. Um, and it also lets you know what your doses are going to be, what you're going to be comfortable with, uh, and what kinds of things you're, that you'll want to do and so on. Right. Um, for instance, if you, uh, you know, suddenly, uh, you get high and suddenly like, you know, you know, that you're going to have the munchies, right? You're going to, you're going to have an overwhelming desire for like, you know, ice cream cake. Right? And uh, <laughs> make, um, make ice cream part of the ritual. <laughs> yeah, right? So, um, uh, so, you know, expecting that and knowing that that's going to happen at a certain point, right? You prepare for it, you put a snack. Right? Uh, uh, otherwise, you know, maybe that's going to interrupt the ritual, right? That, that suddenly at some point yeah. you're going to go like, oh, damn, I wish I had a cookie. But uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so <laughs> don't plan a five-hour ritual if you know you're getting getting munchies in a 30, 30 minutes. That, that's that's right. That's right. So so <laughs> you so you're going to understand your responses to the drug first, uh, mm -hmm. and the same with the ritual. Right. So uh, that that's that's one thing uh, that goes a long way. Now the general aspects of set and setting are also extremely important. Right. If you have um, you have some misconceptions or some misgivings about what you're doing, or you think it's, you know, uh, on some level, it's a bad thing or whatever. Um, and there's a lot of cultural presuppositions at this point in history that we've all been told how many times in our lives over the last several decades that, 
you know, weed is going to make you stupid or it's going to do this or that or the other thing. And, uh, or, you know, LSD, if you have it, when I was growing up, the, the thing was, if you take LSD more than six times, you're, uh, you're clinically crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> clinically insane. Yeah. So, yeah, um, and of course, that none of that is true. And, and we're actually finding these days that these, these things are all very good for mental health under the right conditions. Uh, so, mm. ha, but having those preconceptions and, and things in your mind, yeah, that could, that could screw you up, uh, during a ritual and, uh, you know, the same way, like, like you were talking about your pentagrams, uh, you know, having, having a preconception of, of a pentagram bad thing as you're going into a ritual, uh, it's going to screw with the meaning that you attach to things. So similarly, the, the, uh, your expectations and your understanding of the altered state uh, will also contribute to the result of your ritual, right? If you're, if you're so fearful of sense, it, it's not a good thing. Yeah. So, so in that sense, if you know that those are possibilities and you then maybe set up some anchors in advance to help you collapse that state when it comes about, would that still work if you're, Suddenly you're getting high and you've had a relatively measured dosage, but something in your ritual maybe triggers a past event, a past experience. Um, I, for example, remember once I was working through um, a ceremonial process using cannabis and I took a small dosage and I, I almost, I did a prayer to the plant and I kind of communicated to the plant to kind of align myself to it in my own mind and my own psyche. And I had a, almost like an intuitive warning that said this was going to hurt. And I was like, okay, but I'm still going to go through of it. And I went through of it, but I went through such a trauma and it's such a fear experience. Um, and I realized that this trauma was actually in the back of my mind all the time. And it wasn't from the cannabis. It was from my father from when I was a child and, you know, just conversation and argument to fight that stuck with me. And the cannabis would allow me to kind of go past my normal critical factor and open that. But for somebody that doesn't necessarily have that self-awareness, they don't have the NLP tools immediately to kind of deal with that. What's some advice for somebody that finds them there? Because I find that a lot of people I've spoken to, they're afraid. What happens if it goes wrong? What happens if something comes up and I'm not in control? What's your advice for that? Well, uh, again, being familiar with the state is, goes a long way to, to resolve that. But um... The, if you think that there's a possibility of that, uh, or you're you're going into some things that uh, you know there's unresolved issues around, have somebody else there, right? Have a have a guide, a sitter, right? Somebody who can help mm -hmm. you do that. Also, have some things on hand that will help you to calm down and relax if need be. Um, there's some interesting things with cannabis that we've learned about that there's certain the interactions with the terpenes uh, that are in the plant go a long way to create the quality of the high. So on one hand, finding strains of weed that are benevolent to you, right, that, that are calm yeah. and happy and so on, um, is, is one way of dealing with it, right? The, the higher CBD strains and things like that are a little bit more relaxing and calming and anti-anxiety than necessarily the, the very high THC strains. Um, now you're okay. in South Africa where, uh, I mean, South African weed is legendary for high THC, you know, the Durban yeah. poison and so on is like, oh, yes. <laughs> <you know>. um, <laughs> which is, which personally, that's the kind of stuff I prefer for ritual use. Somebody else might not. I'm, I'm a, you know, I've been smoking weed for, you know, <laughs> for you, you, longer, longer than a lot of people have been alive. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm used to that. And actually when I was growing up, when I was a kid, that's all the weed that there was. It was just that very high THC stuff, mostly from Colombia or Mexico or something. Um, uh, nowadays there's a lot of variety. You can pick and choose and you can have things that are more relaxing or less trippy and things like that. Um, you can also supplement with terpenes and substances without the herb, uh, that okay. can help to calm you down. Uh, smelling, oddly enough, smelling black pepper can calm you down if you're having a bad cannabis experience. You're a little too high or paranoid. Interesting. Um, okay. Uh, uh, some kitchen witches listening. 
that are very go. curious about that. That's right. Um, the, the taste and smell of lemon also can be very common when you're, when you're on cannabis. And this, this stuff has actually been a little bit researched and uh, uh, they know something about this. So it's, uh, this is not just like folk remedy kind of stuff. This stuff actually, it helps, right? So in that sense, like talking about um, like the different strains and the different effects, and I, I know you kind of talk about this more in the book, um, but is there then like an alchemical kind of process when you're working with your your cannabis? I mean, is there a greater benefit if you're if you're finding your own growing your own herb? Um, if there is a conscious relationship between that ways to enhance it, and is that something somebody should just kind of start with, kind of following the steps? Should they do some prep work and studies with other alchemical processes, or how how would one approach that relationship? so to speak, with the cannabis and then moving it up into more refined formats and states to work within your magic? Well, I, I do think that growing your own is, is a wonderful thing to do and get to pick and choose the strains that you grow and you, you actually do enter into a relationship with the plant. It's kind of, kind of a symbiosis. You, can, you learn a lot from that. And then when you actually finally get to, to have some of your crop, uh, after it's harvested and, and so on, it's uh, it's rewarding. It's 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 nice to have something and know that you've started it from your from a seed yourself and so on. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can do. The care that you put into it may be implicit in the uh, in the the result. Whereas if you go to you know uh, particularly like a black market dealer and you buy something, who the hell knows where that weed's been? Uh, how it's been grown, what the the intent of the people growing it was probably greed. Here in America, the, a lot of the black market weed came from Mexico and South America, and there was a lot of violence and uh, I mean just you know crazy stuff. There was you know the, the drug war, and uh, and a lot of that came out of you know these violent gangster cartels and things that were. What's the inherent yep. uh, you know, spiritual energy of this weed, right? I, where where does that come from? And um, at one point, there was there was actually a bunch of rumors, excuse me, that that many of the uh, black market drugs coming into America, particularly the weed and the cocaine, was going through uh, through Haiti. Uh, that was one of the rumors. And Puerto Rico was another of those rumors, and and that it was being cursed by black magicians as it came through to create evil and sow dissent in the United States. Um, now, I don't entirely doubt that. I don't, yeah. but, <laughs> uh, but but the real evil on it was more the the greed and the violence and the and the crime that that was involved in in doing that. Now things are much more peaceful. Um, we're well, new to legalization here, and I'm in New York State, and uh, uh, we're only in our first year of legalization. But but already if things things are much calmer <laughs> and, and yeah. the weed that you get, you can go to a dispensary. New York hasn't opened yet. We drive over to Massachusetts where they have uh, dispensaries and, uh, uh, and you can tell it's been grown with some care. There's people who, who love the plant, who've been cultivating it and, and the, the, the highs are nicer, calmer and so on. So I think there's something to that, right? I mean uh, that, that the, the intent and the, the state of the people providing the, your medicine for you are, uh, uh, that's, that's as important and it's a factor. I think it's such a great idea because uh, I mean, the notion of a conscious grower is such a big thing. I mean, we're aware of like the research about just playing music to plants and how that affects their growth. And if we look at them under the certain kind of conditions, how the communication channels happen between them, you know, depending on the energy of the space and the, the vibe, so to speak. I mean, everything from the work of Dr. Emoto and the water molecule, there's enough, I think, evidence right now for somebody to kind of discover there's there's something else going on with consciousness. And as a person may go, I mean, that's not a big deal, but I mean, it's the same thing of, you know, eating, you know, a lot of sugar, you know, as a child right throughout your life in the beginning, it's not a big deal, but eventually that kind of consciousness starts to impact your body and your health and your well-being. So, and I think when you're working magic, you're working with the more subtle 
vibration, the more subtle energy. And those things, those small moves, those small things are going to come up. You're opening to a, a level of resource inside of yourself, the cerebellum that has 400 billion bits of information access, you know, and the conscious only with this limited range, you're opening to more information. So I think that it is an important piece, but that kind of opens me to the idea now, how is, how is magic on cannabis? How is the entire creation of reality on cannabis different from just normal magic? Talk, talk, talk. Okay. Um, the, what are the main differences between your normal, let's say coffee enhanced state of mind? Uh, right. I mean, most of us, we, we, we have mild stimulants in our lives, right? Coffee, tea, etc. maybe some alcohol, right? Uh, that, that's the normal state of consciousness for most people. Right? And most people I know get up in the morning, they have a cup of coffee, whatever, right? So there's your normal state of consciousness. Now, the brain typically has two main modes of function. One is the is executive function, which is what we normally think of as intelligence, conscious problem solving. Uh, if you're, uh, let's see, you're working a math problem or you're, uh, you know, you're figuring out a puzzle or playing Tetris or something like that, that's executive function, right? You're, you're figuring things out. Uh, and the brain typically gets very quiet when you do that. Now, the other mode of function is the default network, which is what happens when you're not consciously directing your brain. You're not involved in problem solving. The brain goes into uh, this state where, well, they used to think that like if you weren't doing anything, it was sort of like the uh, the mental screensaver would come up and the brain would sort of <laughs> shut down a little bit. It's not true. Actually, what happens okay. is your brain goes, it works even more, right? Uh, daydreams, thoughts, ruminations, um, searches for meaning, uh, actual dreams. And so on. This is all, these are all products of the default network, which is basically mm. it runs your imagination and it be, it works hard to make sense of your, your perceptions and your experiences and to create them as a narrative of your life, the story of your life. Now, okay. um, so typically executive function and the default network are mutually exclusive. When you're, mm. when you're daydreaming, there's no focus problem solving. When you're doing yeah. focus problem solving, there's no daydreaming, right? Uh, yeah. And uh, however, with cannabis, there's some aspects of both networks that can come on at the same time. So you can actually be imaginative and focused, uh, which, which is perfect for doing magic, right? You're, you're still connecting mm. with that realm of, symbols and ideas and and entities and uh the aspects of uh, you know carl jung called magic active imagination and that's essentially what we have here and then at the same time you could be working on your ritual and remembering the steps of your ritual and uh and and doing that kind of executive function task at the same time and maybe even enhancing the ritual and making it better or something as you're going along uh okay. so so you have a little of both at the same time. You have both, uh, again, focused attention and imagination. And that's such a powerful combination. It's, it's sort of, normally you would have to sort of go into one and then take it back to the other one. And, right? it's, it, is, um, it is quite a difficult balance to find. And I think anybody that's really done serious magic, there's almost like this heavy intellectual mental focus. And then you have to almost abandon it at the same time to activate that imagination. So. This is our, our little forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden, it seems. Yeah, exactly. And going back historically, um, there's a, a number of uh, researchers into this, including Albert Hoffman and Richard Evans Schultz and uh, very august uh, ethnobotanists like that, um, who believe that cannabis was really the, the model, the root of almost all of our spiritual traditions that, that initially meditation and yoga and so on were attempts to recreate that experience of being in those mm. states where you could be both creative and focused at the same time. And, uh, uh, and to, to a large extent they do. And, uh, but there's so many different kinds of meditation and yoga and so on that, that you can explore a lot of different aspects of that. 
uh, and then combining that with the cannabis is just even more powerful. So, so is, you really is, is this why? Uh, sorry to interrupt, but is this why the the common association with Shiva and cannabis, Shiva also being a destroyer even of time and space in many scenes with those restrictions of the current version of reality. How's how is that all connected? Yeah, sure. The the uh, um, Shiva uh, and one of the more common versions of the uh, the Hindu uh, creation myth. Uh, there was this vast ocean of nectar that the gods lived on, Amrita. And okay. uh, it was a, it was a milk-like substance and it had to be stirred and purified. Now in uh, the ancient times when you created the beverage bong, B-H-A-N-G, uh, <laughs> uh, not yeah. B-O-N-G, uh, the, uh, <laughs> It's, it's basically taking cannabis in warm milk and crushing it and mixing it and uh, mashing it in there. Um, Interesting. The, uh, uh, so anyway, uh, the, the Amrita got tainted somehow and, and uh, mm. Shiva had to purify it. So he, he's there, he's stirring it, he's mixing it, whatever. And as he's doing it and purifying it, it was a messy job and some drops of Amrita fell to earth, fell from the place of the gods and landed on earth. And every place that a drop of Amrita fell, a cannabis plant grew. And yeah. Shiva came down and, and uh, Shiva being both the Lord of yoga and also the Lord of bong, uh, he gave the plants to mankind to uh, make their lives more joyful and have better sex and sleep better and, and be able to do yoga better. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the followers of Shiva still to this day smoke a lot of weed, right? The, the sadhus, um, if you've ever seen pictures of them, they have, they have bigger dreadlocks than mine and, uh, and, they're, and they smoke out of a chillum and, and uh, that's pretty much the way they praise and connect with Shiva. So, okay. um, so that, that has maintained throughout all the, all the years and there's, it's coming back now. We have, uh, in the United States, I don't know what's happening in South Africa, but the, in the United States, we have 420 yoga classes, right? Places, yoga studios do this, the 420 class where you can come and get high and practice your yoga. Uh, the, uh, there's a bunch of interesting books coming out now on specifically on uh, yoga and cannabis. Uh, one of the, the best ones I've seen so far, uh, there's Dee DeSalt's book, Ganja Yoga, which is very good. And then the, mm. the best one that I, is uh, Chris Killam's book, uh, The Lotus and the Bud. I highly recommend that. Um, okay. he's, it's, a, it's just a fantastic book on yoga just to begin with. <laughs> if you want to learn about yoga, that's a really good book. Uh, and his, he, he recounts his experiences uh, using cannabis through his whole uh, history of that. Chris Killam, uh, if you don't know, is uh, he's known as, he had a TV show called The Medicine Hunter, where he, he traveled mm -hmm. around the world finding different entheogens and medicinal plants and things like that. Uh, so he's moderately famous in the United States for that. He's written a couple books on that. But The Lotus and the Bud is just really, a, uh, it's right up there with, uh, are some of the great books of yoga, right? Uh, autobiography of a yogi, uh, Jewel in the Lotus, and things like that. Uh, so very, very cool thing that, to see that this is coming back. Um, the I think, I think it's also interesting because now there's more kind of science also explaining to us what's actually happening in the brain um, when we're taking the cannabinoids. I mean, we understand that our own bodies actually have cannabinoids. There is a there is an interesting dynamic and a relationship inside that. Um, and I think the entire realm of a yoga opens up such possibilities, especially I love the movement of cannabis yoga. I just think it's, it's such an incredible piece because the body is such a doorway to our own subconscious in many ways and really kind of meshing out and moving through those experiences to open up different things. But that also kind of opens me to the kind of curiosity. And you mentioned Pascal's work with, you know, the sex magic and, and hashish and how that kind of utilization, what's the, what's the relationship between the utilization of cannabis and a practice like sex magic um, and just general ritual practices? Uh, firstly, I, I imagine this is not something necessarily for a beginner, someone that's not experienced, or is this something that anyone can explore? Can you maybe talk about some of the history or some of the ideas around this? 
Okay. Um, well, I think uh, you're referring to in High Magic, I talk about uh, uh, Pashel Beverly Randolph, P.B. Randolph, yeah. um, who was uh, 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 in the, the 1800s, uh, late 1800s in the United States. Uh, he was an African-American, a free, a free African-American back then. And he was actually a friend of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and uh, he was... Uh, he traveled to Europe where he studied with the mesmerists in France and learned mesmerism and hypnosis. Uh, and uh, he also, uh, I, I believe he had some connections with uh, voodoo practitioners and other kinds of spiritual things that were happening at the time in magical traditions. And uh, he described, uh, uh, well, he, he's also well known as one of the originators, or at least one of the first people to really write about sex magic. And his work uh, is probably very fundamental in terms of like what Crowley did, a big influence on Crowley uh, and also on the OTO in general, uh, that his work, his sex magic work became incorporated in, into that. Uh, he, uh, he was also at the time the largest importer of hashish to the United States. And uh, I don't. Right. It'd be curious to see uh, to to find out if he ever hooked up Abraham Lincoln with with some hair. <laughs> uh, you know, who, who knows? But uh, uh, the, the original root of influence to some ideas of of, of the there country. There you go. There you go. And and you know when we find we actually had this is part of American history is that some of our founding fathers were they were they were weed smokers and um, so so sometimes when you find. Uh, these different ways of thinking and suddenly people are making intuitive leaps about culture and politics and so on and then find out that well they were you know George Washington was a pot smoker and, and grew weed on his farm and so on uh, it's for, for some of us it's not that surprising uh, but for, for kind of the mainstream point of view it's like what no <laughs> yeah so anyway uh, Randolph was uh, he described uh, actually Kind of uh, a whole kind of interesting system of magic. Uh, I quote a bunch of stuff about his uh, his clairvoyance and kind of psychic work uh, in the book. Uh, again, the the sex magic stuff sort of evolved into what we know as sex magic today, and, uh, uh, through mm. Crowley and so on. Um, now, again, that's a more I mean that's a fairly intense form of magic, probably one of the more intense forms of magic that you can think of, and. Yes. And it requires kind of ideal situations. I mean, you have to have the right partner, the right set and setting, and so on. And then you're going to combine it with cannabis or something like that. So there's care to be had. <laughs> you would ideally done quite a bit of self work as well. Yeah, you know, exactly. To this point. Uh, exactly. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It's not a kickstart. Let's get kinky, you know, and get high. Right. You know, right. It, yeah, yeah, it may have some side effects. Right. Although, on the other hand, it is very well known that cannabis enhances sex uh, to begin mm. with. And a lot of people have used it as a kind of sex therapy. Um, there's a, uh, a the classic book on the subject would be uh, Robert Anton Wilson's Sex, Drugs and Magic, which he wrote in 1973, I believe. And wow. uh, uh, actually was laying out a lot of that back then. Uh, and it was just republished. Uh, I recommend picking up a copy, even though some of it's a little dated because of the, uh, he was writing it at a time when the, the, the war on drugs was pretty intense in the United States and so on. Uh, oh. The book got heavily suppressed and whatever. Um, but, uh, but anyway, he documented a lot of people who were, uh, who were able to use cannabis and other substances just simply to enhance and maybe heal their relationships and their sex lives. So that's a good foundation mm. to start with, right? And mm. and I mean, you know, a lot of people back from when I was in college and whatever, uh, I mean, going way back, people would always, you know, you know, get high and have sex. And that's, you know, it's fun. It's, it's one of those <laughs> one of those perennial activities. Um, but but then you add the component of magic in. And, uh, yeah. and, and ritual, and it's, it becomes something else entirely. Sex magic is not easy to do, right? There's, there's that level of concentration while you have another level of concentration on top of it. So, <laughs> uh, uh, 
but it's 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 well said exactly it's it's i mean it's such a common experience i mean anyone that's ever been to a burning man or an africa bird knows this is this is part of the the set and setting default ritual you know the the, the fundamental ritual of mankind you know has already been at play there the ceremonial magic aspect is taking that almost to another level and actively working things within so it's not purely just an act of pleasure it reaches a new stage and it usually assumes that some prep work has been done by the practitioner or practitioners going to that level in and of itself. And I love what you highlight there, you know, that shift in paradigm as it has happened. Because we know today of how many tech billionaires that had probably some of their best ideas while high on psilocybin solving problems in the middle of the playa um, coming up with great solutions to technical issues. Because again, the, the, the psychedelic or the ethogen opens up usually disconnected compartments now that that brings me to an interesting piece because you do touch about this in the book when we speak about the concept of entities and 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 beings and things like that and it's a lot of people have maybe sometimes their first experience of a so-called other um or a different intelligence or a higher mind when they're high for the first time you know that first time that person did a heroic dose of psilocybin mushrooms and suddenly they're, you know, in contact with, uh, you know, the plant spirit itself, the God themselves. What's your thoughts here? I mean, this is one of those like touchy subjects because, you know, how do we explain the science? Are, are they, are, are the spiritual beings real? Are they hallucinations? Are they overwhelming portions of data being processed in the brain and generating hallucinatory experiences? Are both answers right? What's your, What's your thoughts on that? I'm leaning towards the both answers are right. Uh, the I, I think it's I, I think first of all we have a lot of different things that we lump into the idea of entities, right? There's mm. the the sense of different aspects of ourselves, right? If you're you're doing like goetic entities, Bowie told us back in 1904 or whatever the hell, but when, when he wrote the introduction to the the Goetia, uh, he said. Uh, the spirits of the Goetia are parts of the human brain. Now, I used to read that and go like, well, he meant mind, right? <laughs> Actually, now, now that we can stick people into uh, fMRI machines and actually watch their brains function, we actually know that personalities actually can, can be located and seen in parts of the brain. And they, they've taken people who have what's known as multiple personality disorder, uh, mm. you know, who have different personalities that are unaware of each other. Uh, mm. They can actually see them in the, put them in a brain scanning uh, situation and actually see the different personalities both at work at the same time, uh, which mm. is very interesting in terms of the way we understand magic. Uh, because yes. some of these entities are, they're aspects of ourselves that are not resolved and so on. Yes. Right? Um, do they have this, resonance? This is all, this is all. Okay, please keep going. Okay. Do they have resonance with uh, like a, a collective unconscious, right? Uh, is, is my experience of Ouroboros the same as your experience of Ouroboros, right? I don't know, right? Mm. I, I, I assume okay. that there's some you know, some resonance maybe, right? Now, then there's, then there's perhaps entities that are external to us that are, that reside in the world. Now, other people could be one of them, right? Uh, you're, yeah. you're looking at this image of me on the screen and you're relating to me as if I'm an, I'm a living, intelligent human being, at least I hope you are. And uh, <laughs> the, uh, but you don't really know that. I could be a complete figment of your imagination. Uh, but anyway, we, we do find uh, entities outside of us, right? Uh, spirits of places and trees and animals and things like that. Oh, but where does it, where do, where do we begin and where do we stop in comparison to that entity again? What is self if even those personalities that we hallucinate or identify with at different periods is such a variable? Yeah, I, I think there's, first of all, there's, a trick that your brain plays on you. There's an area in the the uh, the right side of your brain, the right parietal lobe, that is responsible for giving you a sense of self. And mm. basically, it takes all of these different states and experiences that you have, 
and it kind of ties them together and says, oh, it's still you, it's still you, right? Now, are you the same person when you, you wake up in the morning before you have that cup of coffee uh, as, as you are the person after lunch or what? I mean, somebody who didn't know you and maybe couldn't see your face might think it was a different person because of the way we mm. respond differently and behave differently at different times and places in our lives. Uh, however, that right parietal lobe keeps saying, no, no, still me, still me. Um, <laughs> uh, if you take a, a magnetic beam, what they call a, the transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS gun, and you point yeah. it at that part of the brain and you disrupt it, people will lose the ability to recognize themselves in a mirror uh, and they will lose that sense of self and feel as if they're merging with the world around them. So yeah. we know that that's kind of a trick, right? That, that our brain is playing on us, this personal yeah. sense of self. The false illusion of self. Yes, the that, that's right. The false illusion that we are separate from each other and separate yes. from the world at large. Yes. And humans are it, really, neuroscientists are coming around to the agreement that Humans are a kind of hive mind. We actually mm. connect and communicate with each other on an unconscious basis constantly. If you're in a, a situation with another person, uh, even just talking through the internet like we're doing now, um, there's an awful lot of unconscious communication that's happening beyond our awareness. The way that you're making sense of what I'm saying has as much to do with, first of all, the set and setting, right? Your preconceptions mm -hmm. about what I'm saying and the way you interpret it. And yeah. also the way I'm moving, the tonality of my voice, uh, and, and so on. There's a lot that's being conveyed through that, that your brain is processing below the level of awareness. And mm -hmm. as such, it actually creates collectives of human beings. And so when we have magical concepts like egregores, right, or group entities and uh, things like that, or schools of thought and so on, we're, we're actually maybe looking at entities that are thinking on a level greater than the individual human mind, right? And mm. uh, how do you tap into that, right? Well, you do it by magic, right? You, uh, <laughs> you, you invoke or you evoke and you, and you communicate. Um, so, and then beyond that, we're coming back around into magic is the idea of, uh, excuse me, into science is the idea of panpsychism, that consciousness is a fundamental principle, that everything has some element of consciousness, and mm. that the world itself, uh, you know, we have the, the Gaia hypothesis, that the earth itself is a great consciousness, that the universe itself is a greater consciousness, and so on. Um, science is starting to come to this, and and starting to to provide uh, some good explanations of how these these theories and and senses that humans have always had are uh, actually in fact real things. So um, it's interesting. And and so again, you have this whole level of different kinds of entities, different levels of entities. I mean, the old magic grimoires had the you know the ranks and hierarchies of angels and and so on. And uh, uh, so they were they were tapping into some of that and attempting to explore the the infinity of it i mean it's it's not something that you could probably uh jump into and categorize easily but you could categorize say you know the spirits of your place <laughs> the spirits of your pantheon yeah. things like that rather than trying to to understand what every kind of entity is and so on but I think that's the beauty of the of the kind of overarching view set from the old occult view set, right? I mean, we had almost like the astrological model of the planets and the zodiac and the 72 degrees, which then gives us the 72 me Shema Mephras and the 72 um, Goethic spirits in that sense, which can very much be seen as variant personality expressions of various components of this eternal self or this fundamental consciousness, which is very interesting for me because I remember Timothy Leary in his translation or variation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead, how you related the Tibetan Book of the Dead to the experience on psilocybin, psilocybin related that first, that terror that a lot of people experience when our association to time, place and things starts to dissolve as the releasing of the lower Bordeaux moving into the upper Bordeaux. And it's it's that that ego kind of trap, which 
is the death and rebirth that I think happens through the psychedelic experience as we um, let go of our attachment to those experiences. So in a way, then, does cannabis, does DMT, does, you know, all of this help us to almost be, as the shamans would say, the shapeshifter of personality, the shapeshifter then of reality, if those personalities is part of where we're unconsciously communicating between brains, between our our hive mind, is the who I am in that moment really my magic? I like to, I, I have a phrase that I like to say where I say that magic to me it personally is the study of the communication that is occurring both locally and non-locally. So if I'm aware of that unconscious strategies of my communication, I'm aware of the unconscious rituals I am implementing and my personality, these varied versions, as we call it in NLP, so to speak, um, those are my the stages of the development of where I am magically and spiritually in all these areas of my life. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I think, um, well, to take that back to, to the beginning of what you're saying, the, um, that, that ego death thing that happens with, uh, uh, particularly with the classic psychedelics, with, with uh, mm. LSD or psilocybin in high enough doses or DMT, um, that it actually, we talk about that spot in the right parietal lobe, that actually shuts down at, at higher doses of, of these drugs. And, uh, and you lose that sense of self and there's that ego death, which at first can be very, very confusing. I mean, if you've never experienced it, um, those of us who have experienced it and, and embraced it, we welcome it. It's it's a kind of wonderful, blissful thing. Uh, but but the first time you do it, it feels like you're dying, right? I mean, you, you mistake the death of your ego or the death of some some internal part of yourself, uh, and it's only temporary, of course. You're, it reboots after, right? <laughs> Pretty soon. Um, uh, but that can be very scary, right? I mean, it's it's sort of like dying, and which is why Leary uh, used that, you know, the the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead, which is actually advice for people who are dying, right? Here, here's what's going to happen when you die. So uh, uh, he also talked about some of the, uh, uh, he, uh, when Leary was dying, um, he actually, he sort of showed us some, some interesting things, right? He, yeah. uh, he went out with a party, right? He actually had a good time with his death, and <laughs> which was, which was really kind of, a mind blower for a lot of people. Um, one of the things that he did was he practiced dying and he liked using ketamine uh, as his, mm -hmm. his sort of practice ego death experience. And, uh, and he would do that also nitrous oxide. Uh, and so he would practice ego deaths before he actually died. So he actually got comfortable with it, which was kind of an interesting thing that most of us don't really do. Although, uh, there was recently um, the MAPS organization uh, did some mm -hmm. studies recently with end of life care using psilocybin and uh, uh, with terminal cancer patients uh, and had some, right. some interesting similar things. And also we have that that wonderful story of Aldous Huxley, uh, who mm. uh, on his deathbed got a big injection of LSD. Uh, and, that is that is that is quite the gangster move, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of imagine the glasses dropping down with the cigar and that, that kind of meme, the moment somebody would say that, um, <laughs> yeah, the amplifying power of it. But I think again, like you pointed out you, you so well, you know, where we are going to die. And even if we somehow with the advancements of our technology overcome the need for, you know, mortal death and we're able to transfer into the singularity and accomplish a unity with machines or some extension. At some point, we're going to have to deal with the death of our current concept of self and the world. Um, it's inevitable. We can't continue in those frames to survive what doesn't, what doesn't uh, change dies, so to speak. So a lot of these tools become useful in prepping ourselves for that. And this is just a curious question that's kind of coming up in my mind as we're talking. Is that also then something that happens that when you're using cannabis in terms of magic and you're actively using it to reconstruct something? I mean, if we take a ritual like the LBRP where I'm hallucinating my personal self almost vanishing and myself is the infinite self and I'm identifying with all these attributes that I'm bringing into myself, am I fundamentally restructuring personality and as such personal reality? 
some closing thoughts in terms of that. Yeah, I, I, I think I think that's possible. I don't know that everybody who's doing magic ritual is actually engaging in that that deeper restructuring, um, but it's certainly a possibility in in terms of magic, and and I think the use of cannabis or entheogens makes that even more powerful. Uh, we know that both cannabis and psychedelics uh, cause your brain to uh, do what's called neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. It's creating new neurons and new neural pathways. And uh, so that's, that's actually the, the physical restructuring of your brain. And they did, uh, the Hefter Institute uh, some years ago did a genomic study of LSD. They, they gave people LSD and then tested them to see which genes were activated. And not surprisingly to those of us who've studied this, uh, but the the main genes that were activated were ones that dealt with neuroplasticity, deep, deep oh. learning on the level of your brain actually restructuring itself. So, oh, that's interesting. So, so that's that's a very real thing, and uh, you know, but there's people who sort of dabble around with magic and don't don't put the the full oomph into it, right? Uh, you know, just uh, like. Uh, all right, the the television or movie version of magic where you you mumble something in Latin and it happens, right? You know, blah, 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 right? Um, you know, meh. you try to do magic like that, it doesn't work, right? It's just just saying words. No, there's no real inherent quality to that. But you actually have to have your consciousness behind it, right? You have to be mm. able to, you know, put some energy, some juice into it so it works. I, I also find that kind of progression line is so useful. I mean, just even if I looked at the kind of progression of your books and your material, and for anybody that's, for all of you listening, uh, I recommend, honestly, like, get High Magic. It's a fantastic read, um, especially even if you're beginning and guiding into the pieces. Oh, there we go. Perfect. I loved it. It was, it was a guy, I could, I had some ideas for growing. I could start understanding strains. You had some great links between cannabis and Kabbalah. The yogic history in it was just, it was very exciting, and it really kind of gave me a bit of ground, and it matched a lot of the experiences that I was kind of sensing from it but also the neuroscience that you bring in and a, a lot of that kind of medical dimension really i think helped ground it but one of the things that was great for me especially in the opening is also where you talk about the misconceptions and the impacts of those misconceptions upon us but i think just you know for me a, a frame that was so good is i remember back in the day when i first came out of mixed degrees of spirituality and spiritualism and even Taoism. And a lot of the philosophical ideas were fantastic. And then finding NLP and suddenly having all those concepts make sense in a way that I could practically apply to change behavior myself and in people that I cared about, uh, you know, where they were clients or, you know, for business or anything else like that. And then to bring on the, the magical element and almost now you're actively in a way, like you said so nicely, community, the unconscious minds communicate in this hive mind. We unconsciously communicate and understanding that unconscious communication is something that magic opens us up to. If you're a serious researcher, if you're seriously testing these ideas, uh, you know, the range of hypnosis and things like that, and then compounding that with the, you know, the teaching or the wisdom teachings of the plants and of cannabis, especially I think for somebody that's you know, they're not ready for that um, heroic dose or they don't feel the call to go out and work with ayahuasca or iboga or something, which to me is like the black belt level. <laughs> so I'm not ready for that myself. So I feel like I, I have too much of this ego that I want to keep for business. And if I had to do that, there would be none of it left. So <laughs> cannabis is, seems to be like a safer, more workable plant spirit, so to speak. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you could you could you know take a lot of edibles right if you consume it orally and you, you eat it. I mean, you could you could blow the top of your head off with cannabis. You can get so high that you know you're you're in a totally another realm. But for the for the most part, you know, smoking it, having a little bit, it's controllable. It's easy. It's within that that range where somebody could explore, finish their ritual, and then go about their day. So I, I want to I want to just know from you um, before we kind of bring up this to a close because we're coming to the end of the of the time that we've got and I want to thank you firstly for all the insight and all the ideas that you've shared so far but it, it's we we've passed an hour already and this was so exciting it felt like half an hour so I had a lot of fun thank you firstly for that but 
if somebody is new to your work, um, as an experienced, um, I'm familiar with all your all of your work. I've loved all of them. I've also been a practitioner for you know 30 years myself. So your in your own opinion, for somebody that's new to this, that's just maybe they're a beginner in magic. Let's let's look at those two people. There's the beginner in magic that's new to this. They're new to these ideas. Which of your books would you say you start with? for that person should they go straight to high magic should they maybe just do something else first what's your thoughts on that well high magic has a lot of i I wrote it so that if somebody was interested in the cannabis side and didn't really know anything about magic they would learn something about magic and if somebody was interested in i mean they were well versed in magic but wanted to learn about the cannabis side they could come and, and read high magic and learn that so, so it's kind of aimed at, at both sides, and I think it, it's a good place to start. Uh, I think brain magic is also a good place to start, if, uh, mm. uh, just so, on so, some of the more basic ideas and principles of magic. Okay, so regardless of your background, and that's kind of also what I found, like it, it was very accessible, your ideas and your pieces around that. So pretty much anybody, depending on where your practice is, if you've got the one side and you're looking to balance out the other side, this is such a, a nice piece of work. Do you have any... Other places where um, are you are you hosting any workshops? If somebody's interested in learning more about you, can they work with you directly? Do you have upcoming events or workshops that they can kind of get in touch with? Uh, let's see. Coming up, uh, people can find me on uh, uh, metamagic.com, uh, M-E-T-A, no connection with Facebook, hyphen, uh, magic with a K, dot com. Uh, and uh, my books are on there and my personal consulting service is on there if you want to talk to me directly. Uh, And let's see some upcoming things. Uh, I believe I will be doing a uh, virtual presentation for the Winter Star Festival, which has become a virtual event uh, with the pandemic. Um, I have some other online uh, events that I'm firming updates on. That'll be on the website. Um, And very likely uh, I will be at the Starwood Festival over the summer, an actual in-person appearance, uh, which is in Ohio in the United States. Uh, in July. Uh, so um, some other things in between there that I, I'll announce on the website or uh, uh, you can find me on Facebook too. Uh, so Okay. I'll, I'll, ma- I'll make sure that all those links uh, for everybody listening, they will be in the description. And if you're listening on Spotify or any of the other channels, pop onto uh, the YouTube channel and you'll get all the links down there as well as through all of our media. Um, so, so we can make sure that you can get in touch with Phil. If you are, if you do have a specific question or something that you'd like to follow up and see Phil and again, Phil again on the show, please message us, leave a comment, and we'll bring that discussion up. You know, you know, if there's if there's an interest for it, uh, Phil, I want to ask one kind of closing thing about some of the past material, um, and especially it's just because I know that somebody's going to be out there and they're going to be googling you and they're going to be hunting forums to get some of your books and they're going to buy some stuff, and there's going to be a very interesting heading at some place where it says how to be a megalomaniac. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, now I'm, I'm familiar with your work and, and your liberated mind and how you freed yourself from the system of things. So can you give us a view set or a frame around understanding that? <laughs> okay. Well, at the time I, I, I created that as a, it was a mock seminar thing that I created in the 1990s. And uh, back then there was a, an awful lot of uh, seminars and things that were created with a sort of spiritual gloss, but they were they were more about like, you know, how to make more money, how to how to get a good job, how to be, you know. So uh, I, I I wanted to spoof that because it was it was it was getting a little bit much over the top. So uh, so you want a new car, you want money, you want sex, you want everything. You're a megalomaniac, right? Why not? So. Uh, on one hand, I want people to recognize some of that, the, the, the overwhelming materialism uh. of, of, of some of those seminars and things like that uh, in a humorous way. And also to, uh, uh, to defend against that, right? I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, by teaching how uh, advertisers and gurus and corporations and media and so on attempt to influence you and control your mind and so on. Um, mm-hmm. you could, I, I don't think anybody ever took my course and, and went out and, and started their own cult or something like that. Uh, but the, the, the real reason I did it was to teach people these, these things so they could be on the lookout for it and not be so influenced by, 
hmm. the way that you know the, these outside forces try to push us around and get our money and our lives and our time and so on. I think that's one of the great things. Um, it, when we look at the occult world, there's so many charlatans out there. And even when we look at the spiritual world, there's so many charlatans out there that are just out there trying to make a quick buck. And a lot of them will actually use a lot of the techniques of NLP, of hypnosis, of all of these things, maybe not in the most ethical way. And the fact of the matter is, you know, just remaining positive and surrounding yourself with love and light is just not going to do the trick. Um <laughs> understand you know knowledge is the only cure you know you know getting the understanding of these things and again if you're out there if you're listening get your hands on brain magic and high magic get them together get a good sense of that material so you understand how those things are and look at some of the other books <laughs> if you can find uh, any kind of online pieces on how to be a megalomaniac or maybe you know we'll have a repeat workshop in the future on that <laughs> The ideas are fundamental because you can also become aware of how you may have been pre-programmed by other occult authors or other practitioners or advertising companies and how that programming may be limiting your own possibility. You know, one of the things I loved about this conversation today is, you know, how the frame, you know, again, drugs was that old mindset. We, in the past, it was like if a person had, you know, dreadlocks, a person had, uh, you know, had drugs in their piece or something like that, they were just like a hippie. They weren't intelligent people. They weren't successful business people. I think anybody just needs to pick up one of your books, Phil, to know that's absolute rubbish, <laughs> you know, kind of a thing. So a very well educated, very intelligent work, very well put together, very good structures and applying magic in a way that is practical. Um, so make sure you get a copy of that. We'll make sure links are in the description. Phil, it's been an absolute honor. Thank you so much for your time on the show. And I hope I get to have a conversation with you again in the future. Cool. Thank you for having me on. This was a, a lot of fun. I've always felt a little different, a little uneasy between regular folk, a bit of a dreamer, a lost cause, a little non-ordinary, some would say. I think I've always just been this way. My mother said I was special. My father thought I should be feared. But I knew that witchcraft coursed through my veins the first time I tasted the lips of the goddess inside the rain. Yes, I'm a witch, it's true. And sure, we are the ones who believe in the beauty of nature, who believe in the things science, absent of art, cannot explain. Who instead of religion would have romance. And sure, you may think we have lost our way, when in the world of predictable things we have such unfamiliar things that we would like to say. But maybe in a world so cold and alone, a little unfamiliar is exactly what is needed to show us the way home.